The Spectre Bridegroom by William Hunt Long, long ago, a farmer named Lenine lived in Bosian. He had but one son, Frank Lenine, who was indulged into waywardness by both his parents. In addition to the farm servants, there was one, a young girl, Nancy Trenoweth, who especially assisted Mrs. Lenine in all the various duties of a small farmhouse. Nancy Trenoweth was very pretty, and although perfectly uneducated in the sense in which we now employ the term education, she possessed many native graces, and she had acquired much knowledge really useful to one whose aspirations would probably never rise higher than to be mistress of a farm of a few acres. Educated by parents who had certainly never seen the world beyond Penzance, her ideas of the world were limited to a few miles around the land's end. But although her book of nature was a small one, it had deeply impressed her mind with its influences. The wild waste, the small but fertile valley, the rugged hills with their crowns of cairns, the moors rich in the golden firs and the purple heath, the sea-beaten cliffs and the silver sands, were the pages she had studied, under the guidance of a mother who conceived, in the sublimity of her ignorance, that everything in nature was the home of some spirit form. The soul of the girl was imbued with the deeply religious dye of her mother's mind whose religion was only a sense of an unknown world immediately beyond our own. The elder Nancy Trenoweth exerted over the villagers around her considerable power. They did not exactly fear her. She was too free from evil for that. But they were conscious of a mental superiority and yielded without complaining to her sway. The result of this was that the younger Nancy, although compelled to service, always exhibited some pride from a feeling that her mother was a superior woman to any around her. She never felt herself inferior to her master and mistress, yet she complained not of being in subjection to them. There were so many interesting features in the character of this young servant girl that she became in many respects like a daughter to her mistress. There was no broad line of division in those days, even in the manorial hall between the lord and his domestics, and still less defined was the position of the employer and the employed in a small farmhouse. Consequent on this condition of things, Frank Lenine and Nancy were thrown as much together as if they had been brother and sister. Frank was rarely checked in anything by his overfond parents, who were especially proud of their son, since he was regarded as the handsomest young man in the parish. Frank conceived a very warm attachment for Nancy, and she was not a little proud of her lover. Although it was evident to all the parish that Frank and Nancy were seriously devoted to each other, the young man's parents were blind to it and were taken by surprise when one day Frank asked his father and mother to consent to his marrying Nancy. The Lenines had allowed their son to have his own way from his youth up, and now, in a matter which brought into play the strongest of human feelings, they were angry because he refused to bend to their wills. The old man felt it would be a degradation for a Lenine to marry a Trenoweth, and, in the most unreasoning manner, he resolved it should never be. The first act was to send Nancy home to Al Jamil, where her parents resided. The next was an imperious command to his son never again to see the girl. The commands of the old are generally powerless upon the young, where the affairs of the heart are concerned. So were they upon Frank. He who was rarely seen of an evening beyond the garden of his father's cottage was now as constantly absent from his home. The house, which was wont to be a pleasant one, was strangely altered. 
a gloom had fallen over all things. The father and son rarely met his friends. The mother and her boy had now a feeling of reserve. Often there were angry altercations between the father and son, and the mother felt she could not become the defender of her boy in his open acts of disobedience, his bold defiance of his parents' commands. Rarely an evening passed that did not find Nancy and Frank together in some retired nook. The Holy Well was a favorite meeting place, and here the most solemn vows were made. Locks of hair were exchanged. A wedding ring, taken from the finger of a corpse, was broken when they vowed that they would be united, either dead or alive. And they even climbed at night the granite pile at Trerin, and swore by the Logan Rock the same strong vow. Time passed onward unhappily, and, as the result of the endeavors to quench out the passion by force, it grew stronger under the repressing power, and, like imprisoned steam, eventually burst through all restraint. Nancy's parents discovered at length that moonlight meetings between two untrained, impulsive youths had a natural result, and they were now doubly earnest in their endeavors to compel Frank to marry their daughter. The elder Lenine could not be brought to consent to this, and he firmly resolved to remove his son entirely from what he considered the hateful influences of the Trenoweths. He resolved to go to Plymouth, to take his son with him, and, if possible, to send him away to sea, hoping thus to wean him from his folly, as he considered this love madness. Frank, poor fellow, with the best intentions, was not capable of any sustained effort, and consequently he at length succumbed to his father. And, to escape his persecution, he entered a ship bound for India, and bade adieu to his native land. Frank could not write, and this happened in days when letters could be forwarded only with extreme difficulty. Consequently, Nancy never heard from her lover. A babe had been born into a troublesome world, and the infant became a real solace to the young mother. As the child grew, it became an especial favorite with its grandmother. The elder Nancy rejoiced over the little prattler and forgot her cause of sorrow. Young Nancy lived for her child and on the memory of its father. Subdued in spirit she was, but her affliction had given force to her character, and she had been heard to declare that wherever Frank might be, she was ever present with him. Whatever might be the temptations of the hour, that her influence was all-powerful over him for good. She felt that no distance could separate their souls, that no time could be long enough to destroy the bond between them. A period of distress fell upon the Trenoweths, and it was necessary that Nancy should leave her home once more and go again into service. Her mother took charge of the babe, and she found a situation in the village of Kimyal, in the parish of Paul. Nancy, like her mother, contrived by force of character to maintain an ascendancy amongst her companions. She formed an acquaintance, which certainly never grew into friendship, with some of the daughters of the small farmers around. These girls were all full of the superstitions of the time and place. The winter was coming on, and nearly three years had passed away since Frank Lenine left his country. As yet, there was no sign. Nor father, nor mother, nor maiden had heard of him, and they all sorrowed over his absence. The Lenines desired to have Nancy's child, but the Trinoweths would not part with it. They went so far even as to endeavor to persuade Nancy to live again with them, 
but Nancy was not at all disposed to submit to their wishes. It was All Hallows' Eve, and two of Nancy's companions persuaded her, no very difficult task, to go with them and sow hemp seed. At midnight, the three maidens stole out unperceived into Kimyal Town Place to perform their incantation. Nancy was the first to sow, the others being less bold than she. Boldly she advanced, saying, as she scattered the seed, Hemp seed, I sow thee. Hemp seed, grow thee. And he who will my true love be, come after me and shaw thee. This was repeated three times when, looking back over her left shoulder, she saw Lenin. But he looked so angry that she shrieked with fear and broke the spell. One of the other girls, however, resolved now to make trial of the spell, and the result of her labors was the vision of a white coffin. Fear now fell on all, and they went home sorrowful to spend each one a sleepless night. November came with its storms, and during one terrific night a large vessel was thrown upon the rocks in Burno Hall Cliff, and, eaten by the impetuous waves, she was soon in pieces. Amongst the bodies of the crew washed ashore, nearly all of whom had perished, was Frank Lenine. He was not dead when found, but the only words he lived to speak were begging the people to send for Nancy Trenoweth, that he might make her his wife before he died. Rapidly sinking, Frank was borne by his friends on a litter to Bossian, but he died as he reached the town place. His parents, overwhelmed in their own sorrows, thought nothing of Nancy, and, without her knowing that Lenine had returned, the poor fellow was laid in his last bed in Burian churchyard. On the night of the funeral, Nancy went, as was her custom, to lock the door of the house, and, as was her custom too, she looked out into the night. At this instant, a horseman rode up in hot haste, called her by name, and hailed her in a voice that chilled her blood. The voice was the voice of Lenine. She could never forget that. And the horse she now saw was her sweetheart's favorite colt, on which he had often ridden at night to Alja. The rider was imperfectly seen, but he looked very sorrowful and deathly pale. Still, Nancy knew him to be Frank Lenine. He told her that he had just arrived home, and that the first moment he was at liberty, he had taken horse to fetch his loved one and to make her his bride. Nancy's excitement was so great that she was easily persuaded to spring on the horse behind him that they might reach his home before the morning. When she took Lenine's hand, a cold shiver passed through her, and as she grasped his waist to secure herself in her seat, her arm became as stiff as ice. She lost all power of speech and suffered deep fear yet she knew not why. The moon had arisen and now burst out in a full flood of light through the heavy clouds which had obscured it. The horse pursued its journey with great rapidity, and whenever in weariness it slackened its speed, 
the peculiar voice of the rider aroused its drooping energies. Beyond this, no word was spoken since Nancy had mounted behind her lover. They now came to Trove Bottom, where there was no bridge at that time. They dashed into the river. The moon shone full in their faces. Nancy looked into the stream and saw that the rider was in a shroud and other grave clothes. She now knew that she was being carried away by a spirit. Yet she had no power to save herself. Indeed, the inclination to do so did not exist. On went the horse at a furious pace until they came to the blacksmith's shop near Burian Churchtown, when she knew by the light from the forge fire thrown across the road that the smith was still at his labors. She now recovered speech. Save me! Save me! Save me! She cried with all her might. The smith sprang from the door of the smithy with a red-hot iron in his hand, and as the horse rushed by, caught the woman's dress and pulled her to the ground. The spirit, however, also seized Nancy's dress in one hand, and his grasp was like that of a vice. The horse passed like the wind, and Nancy and the smith were pulled down as far as the old almshouses near the churchyard. Here the horse for a moment stopped. The smith seized that moment, and with his hot iron burned off the dress from the rider's hand, thus saving Nancy, more dead than alive, while the rider passed over the wall of the churchyard and vanished on the grave in which Lenine had been laid but a few hours before. The smith took Nancy into his shop, and he soon aroused some of his neighbors, who took the poor girl back to Alja. Her parents laid her on her bed. She spoke no word but to ask for her child, to request her mother to give up her child to Lenine's parents, and her desire to be buried in his grave. Before the morning light fell on the world, Nancy had breathed her last breath. A horse was seen that night to pass through the church town like a ball from a musket, and in the morning Lenine's colt was found dead in Burnow Hall Cliff, covered with foam, its eyes forced from its head, and its swollen tongue hanging out of its mouth. On Lenine's grave was found the piece of Nancy's dress which was left in the spirit's hand when the smith burnt her from his grasp. It is said that one or two of the sailors who survived the wreck related after the funeral how, on the 30th of October, at night, Lenine was like one mad. They could scarcely keep him in the ship. He seemed more asleep than awake, and, after great excitement, he fell as if dead upon the deck, and lay so for hours. When he came to himself, he told them that he had been taken to the village of Kimyal, and that if he ever married the woman who had cast the spell, he would make her suffer the longest day she had to live for drawing his soul out of his body. Poor Nancy was buried in Lenine's grave, and her companion in sowing hemp seed, who saw the white coffin, slept beside her within the year.